you know, Bob, there's always recency bias. I remember years ago, you know, when a baseball player takes some games off in June and people complain, but I went back and looked at George Brett several years ago. George Brett missed 35 games a year. Now, he was playing on AstroTurf. He played hard. He got dinged up. But this idea that everybody always played 162 games, hey, a lot of guys oh. took games off. When you go back to the 80s NBA that you covered, uh, do we give the former players too much credit? Were some of them uh, difficult employees? Did they take games off? Were they petty? Um, you know, you see guys now take stuff off their social media if contract negotiations <laughs> don't go perfectly. We tend to bang on, you know, current athletes. But go back to the 80s. Were some of those guys a pain in the rear? Yeah, there was always a pain in the rear, but it didn't manifest itself in not playing. It wouldn't have entered the mind of the Birds and the Magics and the Michaels to, to not play if they were healthy enough to play, that's what you did. They, they, I mean, it, it just wasn't a part of the thought process at all. Oh, of course, there were some guys who were more pain. And to, you said taking nights off. I, I, I smiled thinking and the late Janice Johnson. There'd be a couple of games a year. There'd be certain games a year when and only a home game and only when uh, they knew they were going. It was against an opponent they should beat without any question. DJ would would kind of take it easy that night. And I know he go up to Danny Ainge and say, uh, right, you're going to get the shots tonight. I mean, I heard this from both of them. And yeah, and, and uh, you can find those games. I have my right in this office where I'm sitting. I've got my my year by year books from the 80s uh, that I kept every night because of those that was predated all the statistical information you can get at the, on your fingertips, you know, by picking up your, your 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 cell phone today. And I had to keep my own books and I can find you the games where DJ, you know, just took four shots and Danny yeah. 15 shots. He never cost them a game, you know, and, and the flip side of that, you know, he's the guy that Larry Bird famously said, and we iterated best player I ever played with, which I'm sure really annoys Kevin McHale. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> I believe that by the way, it does. And that uh, you can see the big, he was the classic big game player. Yeah. And, and Larry, and, 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 and to that, um, Larry said, you knew that DJ, here's how you knew DJ was ready for the game. He went to the basket immediately. And when DJ went to the basket hard early, he knew it was a signal. Okay, boys, you know, I'm here. Let's go. Yeah. <laughs> um, have you watched, by the way, HBO special on the Lakers, the Jeff Perlman book, Winning Time? Have you seen any of that yet? I have watched episodes one and two, and I plan to keep doing it despite my better judgment. But I will need a, <laughs> a barf bucket before it's over. Uh, it it is okay. It's a it's a dramatization. Yes, it it doesn't make it pre a secret about the fact that it's a dramatization based on a book, based on a book. I think the only thing that it, that is true that they based it on was that it's about the Lakers. About everything else is is fantasy. I just fear that too many gullible people might actually think these things happened, or that these people are like this. If I were Jerry West, I my first, I would say call my lawyer. Here's my lawyer. I cannot. I don't know what Jerry West ever did to Adam McKay to be portrayed in such an unflattering light, an unrealistic light, a, 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 a just embarrassing light. And that's just for openers, uh, Colin. The Red Auerbach betrayals, preposterous. I hear what they've done to Larry is is is, is preposterous. It's disgusting. The awful and and. and uh, the world didn't need this. I'm sorry. Oh, it, but I got to keep watching because people talk about it. I do a podcast. You know, I got to talk about it. And, and it's, it, it's, it's outrageous. It's horrible. Well, West and Arbach are made to look really bad early. Uh, Kareem is so prickly, which, by the way, Kareem is legendarily prickly. Uh, he takes the beating in episodes three, four, and five. Arbach was playfully arrogant. Uh, they have him as mean-spirited in Adam McKay's version. What was Red really like? Red was an a, a interesting man. who uh, it was, He was a very, very bright man who, who chose to make his living uh, in basketball, who I think had a born leadership qualities that would have made him a successful businessman, a CEO of some kind. He was a leader. And, and, and he, he, had, he was a visionary in his game. Uh, you know, first of all, you have to go, just go all the way back to the draft, to, to the manipulations that took place to get Bill Russell on the team. I mean, it, it, it seems so self-evident after 11 championships in 13 years that Russell was the best player around. 
But it wasn't so self-evident to the world, or else he never would have gotten to Boston as the third pick, in, um, you know, who had third pick in 1956. And Red saw that he was the answer to his dreams about a guy to get the ball off the boards, trigger his fast break, and and saw in him the defensive ability that we had never seen in the world. Bill Russell changed the concept. He in, he didn't invent the block shot. He perfected it, and he made it a part of the game in a way that uh, it had not been before. And, and the intimidation of shots and so forth is genesis in the game of basketball. It starts with Bill Russell. Anyway, not everybody saw that. If the Hawks knew that, you know, they wouldn't have done what they did, although there was a racist element to that, too. And if the, and, and how about number two? How about how they got him from the, from the Rochester Royals by, by Walter Brown, the owner of the Celtics, promising Lester, uh, making a deal with Lester Harrison, the owner of the, of the uh, Rochester Royals, that he would give, uh, and, and uh, Walter Brown owned the ice capades, that he would give them ice capade dates uh, in exchange for getting the number two pick in the draft. <laughs> and that's how they got uh, the number two pick in the draft. But uh, Red, I could give you examples of Red's sense of humor and Red's, and Red's uh, 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 you know, uh, let me say impish nature as uh, well. But, uh, uh, but Red was ahead of the game and smarter than everybody else. You were in the, the belly of those Lakers 80s, that, that, that decade, which is to me the, the 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 peak of the NBA, even though it was an early peak, it was as good as the NBA was. You had six or seven really good teams and two great ones, the Lakers and the Celtics. It's almost a cliche now to say that Larry Bird is underrated historically because there's just there's you know Larry was a different player. But I went and looked at some Larry Bird articles a couple years ago. Jack McCallum may have written them. I went back to Sports Illustrated. I would just had time to waste on these archival articles. And the way he described him is how we describe LeBron. He was like, there's never been a forward like this. No. Uh, it, it, if you'd never, it, you wouldn't know they weren't written today about LeBron James. Take people back to the beginning of that rivalry and the emergence of Bird as a superstar. Was it, was it day one, week one? Did everybody in Boston know? It didn't take long. You know, I mean, I, I was uh, rare in the Boston media. I had actually seen him in college in person the year before. At the end of his junior year, uh, I was covering the, and the, the NCAA tournament, the first round game between Providence and Michigan State in Indianapolis on a Saturday afternoon. The night before, Indiana State was playing Illinois State in an NIT game in Terre Haute. Uh, so I got... Uh, I drove out there with Jason Stark and Mike Madden, of the, who were then both working for the Providence Journal, and we went to the game and watched Bird. Uh, and and the first time I saw Larry Bird make a play, the, the they shot and missed. Uh, the, the Illinois State did. Larry got a got a rebound, and he dribbled up the left hand side of the court. And as he approached mid court, he he uh, off the dribble, he threw a bullet pass underhand a seed about a 35 foot or 40 to streaking Carl Nix for a layup that's the yep. first time I ever saw him touch the ball I went oh my god and he winds up making the game winning basket and and uh I was dazzled by Bird now so I was able to preach the gospel a little bit you know when they drafted him uh about what we were what we were getting uh now of course he had that wonderful senior year we all know that and it was coming yep. out of the of uh, uh, the, the famous final four and all that. But um, okay, so now we get to the NBA. He makes a debut in New York in an exhibition doubleheader against the 76ers. So his first opponent uh, of stature he plays is Dr. J. He holds his own very well there. And when the season started, you know, we, we knew we had something pretty special. He didn't put up dazzling game, uh, night uh, numbers the first night. They beat the Rockets on the opening night. More distinguished was the fact that that was the first year of the three-point shot, and Chris Ford actually hit the first three-point shot technically in the history of the game because their game started earlier than the other games, you know. And, he, <laughs> and that's true. He, he he can truthfully say he hit the first three-point shot ever. Anyway, it didn't take long. We knew we had to, we had, we had something very very special here, and uh, you know the whole package, the points, the rebounds, but above all the passing. And we knew, and you know, he winds up he gets the rookie of the year. Uh, uh, award over Magic, and and you know Magic had the last laugh because he got the you know he, he got the the championship that year. But uh, it was evident very quickly. He was first team All League as a rookie. I mean, come on, everybody recognized it pretty quickly. You know, Bob, of all the great dynasties and the great lore of Boston sports, as an outsider, the Celtics in the Bird years feel as or more popular 
than Belichick's Patriots and any Red Sox team. They really do to me. I don't know why that is. Am I wrong? Uh, I would say it's that's close. I mean, I'd, I'd love to to tip the rubber stamp on it because I'm a you know baseball basketball guy before I'm a football guy. But it, it, the Patriots are pretty big. Brady, it's hard to top. I mean, I just I don't. In fact, I had to admit a number of years ago that in, in, on the Boston mythical Rushmore, I had to bump Larry for Brady. And uh, and uh, this is how good our Rushmore is. If you got if you got Bill Russell, Ted Ted Williams, Bobby Orr as uh, <laughs> unquestioned. <laughs> you must have them. Uh, then, you know, who's Larry was my other, but Brady, I had to say, I got to be in all honesty. You know, I got to, I got to bump Larry. That's how great the Boston rush was. Okay. That it was special. I remember early on in uh, no, first, maybe the second year, one night the, the, the jazz came in at a point when they were at their nader, they were terrible. At one point, the Celtics beat them over for 20 straight times and they sold the building out. And this was early in the season. That was a revelation. You know, you have to understand what they were doing before Larry Bird came. They were averaging, like, they were lucky to average, I don't know, barely, didn't average 10,000 a night, I don't think. And uh, suddenly they sold the building out for an early season game against Utah. I said, oh, my God, you know. Oh, yeah. I mean, that, that's where we came from. And then, of course, they went to a point where they're selling out every game. But that was that was a gradual evolution. No, and Larry Larry was the direct, you know, the team didn't just improve only because, and consider this, Larry gets the preponderance of the credit for the running from 29 to 61, you know, uh, games. But they get a real coach in Bill Fitch. They they sign ML Carr from the Pistons, who was a very important player for them. Gerald Henderson was a very nice addition as, a, as yep. an extra, extra draft pick. And Tiny Archibald got healthy after a couple of years siege. He had gotten he had hurt his Achilles. He got stepped on by Tom Borwinkle. Imagine that. And, uh, uh, and, and he got healthy. And so all those things came together. To, to, and, and Bird was still the most important thing. But don't underestimate the value of having Bill Fitch, you know, because they were uh, and, and tying everything together for them. 